Welcome to our live stream coming to you on a Thursday. It feels like Friday because we're doing a live stream and a taping of a show. Uh, but quite frankly, there's a reason for all that. My uh, class reunion is this weekend, and I was not about to miss that. I uh, see a lot of my friends from a long time ago. 50-year class reunion. Wow. wow. That's what I'm thinking. Wow. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're doing a lot of things earlier in the week this week, including the live stream. And we thank you for joining us. Pam Case is with me, and she'll be reading questions that you send in, which I hope you're starting to do right now. If you send a super chat, get more visibility, bumps it up to the top. Moderators watch the chat for the questions. They feed them here to us on the set, and we'll try to get to uh, as many as we can. But we want you to send them because if you don't send them, we have nothing to respond to. Now, today we're going to be talking about Joe Biden's painful 60 Minutes interview this week. Also, an insurrection occurred in D.C. this week. It was a day worse than Pearl Harbor and 9-11 combined. Did you even hear about it? And the greatest politician on the planet just gave Xi Jinping the boot. That's right. So, a lot to talk about, lots of great video to uh, take a look at. Uh, we always do a pre-show poll. Yes. Pam, what is our pre-show poll today? Oh, we had some fun and over 500 folks participated. Nice. Sitting in queue while they were waiting for us today. Which is the greatest threat to our country? Hmm. Here we go. Okay. Uh, the January 6th rioters. Mm -hmm. uh, House GOP not electing a speaker. Mm -hmm. um, China or, here we go, Kamala's laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing that in my ear, I'm thinking Kamala's laugh. Let's hear what it is. Oddly enough, uh, our viewers today chose China at 60 percent. was that's the greatest the threat realistic. to our country. That would yeah. be realistic, that's, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> followed by, and probably rightfully so, House GOP not selecting a speaker mm. at 27 percent. Followed by Kamala's laugh. Do we have to hear that again in our ear? Um, <laughs> And January 6th, yes, I guess we do. I guess we do. <laughs> and January 6th rioters at 1%. Wow. I, you know, I was thinking that one of those was going to be climate change because, you know, recently uh, Joe Biden said that the greatest existential threat in the world, not nuclear Iran, not Russia taking over Europe, none of that, it was climate change. Yeah. And when pressed on it, John Kirby, spokesman for the White House national security team, Agreed. Oh, yes, climate change is yeah. the greatest threat we have. Wow. There Weird. You go. Anyway, our top comment from last week's live stream comes from Elizabeth Brady. She said, I quote, I'm glad to hear about the rich donors pulling out of Harvard. So encouraging. There had to be an intolerable limit, and this is it. Elizabeth, I agree with you. Uh, it's just been amazing to see many of the highest dollar donors for the big universities, not just Harvard, um, but also um, the Huntsman family of Utah, one of the richest families in the country, big givers to University of Pennsylvania, to Penn. And they said, not another dime. We're done with you. I think this is great. It's about time that the yes. donors put their checkbooks in the drawer and say, you know, if you're going to get out there and condemn Israel, whose people are being slaughtered and massacred, and you're going to defend the people who did the murdering, then we don't want to help that institution anymore. I think some forgot that the uh, checkbook has a pretty loud voice. Ooh, yes, it does. And I'm glad it does. And really, up until now, even the people with the checkbooks kind of looked the other way yeah. with all the wokeism on campus. But this was a bridge too far. Yeah. And for many people, they could not abide by the fact that this was not just idiotic Marxism. This was the murder of innocent children and women and families. And, and you, how do you defend that? Well, right. civilized people don't. That's the whole point. All right, we got a question for you this week. We'd love your response. Should the pro-Palestinian protesters at the Capitol be treated the same way as the January 6th protesters? Hmm. Leave your answers in the chat or in the comments section below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so we can let you know when we're going to be doing one of these. Because, see, if you weren't subscribed and had the notification bell, you might have said, oh, you guys will be on Friday. But uh, no, no. And the only way you would know is to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Also, be sure to like the uh, broadcast and to share it with other people. Let's get underway. Joe Biden did a sit-down interview with 60 Minutes this past week. And from the very beginning, it 
it became obvious that Scott Pelley's main job was not to do a serious, thoughtful, provocative interview. It was to uh, put a blanket around Joe Biden and make sure he was comfortable. He all but served him warm milk and cookies. Listen to Scott Pelley's introduction of Joe Biden. It's just bizarre. Rarely does a president confront so much peril, the catastrophe in Israel, the war in Ukraine, and no help from a paralyzed Congress. Late Thursday, we met President Biden at the White House. It had been a rough week, and we could see it on him. Mr. Biden will be 81 next month, and he has said that when he's tired, his lifelong stutter can creep back in. But he wedged us into his schedule. Wedged us into his schedule. Have you seen his schedule? Most days they call a lid at like 10 in the morning. And when they say call a lid, that's, that's Washington speak for that closes the day. There are no more appointments or events. Now, maybe he makes a few calls. Maybe he reads uh, some comic books. I don't know. He can do something. But when the White House calls a lid, it basically says the president is done for the day. And most days they call a lid by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And so somehow this guy who's so busy, um, and I'm not saying he hasn't been involved in a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going on. But Scott Pelley, the apologist for Joe Biden and his administration, can you imagine Scott Pelley saying that about Donald Trump? No. That, oh, he's so busy and he's got so much on his plate. None of that. Uh Uh-uh. Never going to happen. Well, in the interview, it was... It was kind of painful to watch. Near the end of it, um, Scott Pelley makes some comments about all that's going on in terms of world crises. Let's watch this. We spoke to the president. His secretary of state was in Israel. His defense secretary was at a NATO meeting on Ukraine. America's oldest president seemed tired from directing all of this. I'm sure he was tired. Um, I'm not sure that he was directing all of this. Maybe he was, but what we typically see is that Joe Biden barely knows what is even happening, much less that he's directing it. Um, I also found it really interesting that Joe Biden took this occasion, all those people who said, oh, Joe Biden will bring us together, he'll unify the country. Well, he won't do it by making comments like this about the Republican Party and its members. Look, This is not your father's Republican Party. 30% of it is made up of these MAGA Republicans who are maybe... Democracy is something I don't... They don't look at it the same way you and I look at democracy. See, that's an insult to every person who is a Republican and a person, he says, these MAGA Republicans. What does that mean, Joe? MAGA, make America great again. Do you not want America to be great again? Maybe that's what he's saying. I mean, many of us, it's, it's simple. We'd like for America to be top of the heap, not bottom. We don't want to have to apologize. We don't want to be third rate. And if that's what he's talking about, and when he says, this is not your father's Republican Party, my answer to that is good. I'm glad it didn't. Because I can remember when the Republican Party wasn't that pro-life, didn't stand for really all that much other than making sure they had nice tables at the country club. I'm glad to see the Republican Party become the party of the working class men and women of America, want to put manufacturing back, seal the borders, have a strong military, believe in traditional values, stands for uh, sanctity of human life. That's a good thing. I like the new Republican Party, and I like for America to be great again. So, Joe, you were insulting me. Didn't work. Um, I want to get into Israel because obviously you cannot turn on your television, radio, or read a newspaper without realizing that Israel is at war with Hamas. Uh, It was not started by Israel. I'm so sick when I hear these people on national television, CNN is bad, MSNBC is the worst by far, who tries to make it some equivocal, uh, equivocal issue between Hamas and Israel. It's not. This is not a both sides-ism where, well, now both sides ought to, no. Hamas attacked Israel and didn't attack so much the country, its military, or its infrastructure. It attacked by killing in cold blood women, children, elderly people in a surprise sneak attack 
that was the most vicious, brutal assault on human dignity since the Holocaust. Just horrific things that were done. And um, I, I think it's interesting when Joe Biden first sat down with Bibi Netanyahu, to his credit, Joe Biden, let me be fair, has been vocal, outspoken, as has Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, in verbally expressing their support for Israel in the midst of this. I appreciate that. I truly do. Uh, but when he first sat down with Prime Minister Netanyahu, he was reading from some index cards, and you could tell he was utterly confused by what he was reading, and he finally just trailed off. Let's watch. You know, uh, years ago, I asked the Secretary of State, would he and I work in the Senate to write something for me? And he said, uh, he wrote a line that uh, I think is appropriate. He said, uh, it's not, we lead... Uh, not just, uh, well, I won't go into it. I'll wait later. I'm taking too much time. What do you mean you're taking too much time? It's your time. You're the President of the United States. You can take all the time you want. What happened, Joe? I mean, we all know we're not stupid. You forgot what the line was. It's like setting up a joke on, on stage at the comedy club and then forgetting the punchline. And then just trailing off and saying, well, uh, here's that line. He wrote in a speech. And, uh, well, we won't go into it. I'm taking up too much time. I'll tell you later. He never told us later never told us later. A responsible press would have said, Mr. President, you said you were going to tell us later. What was it you were going to tell us? Because now it's later and you can tell us. But they deep down are covering for him because they know he doesn't remember it. He doesn't know. After he finishes this uh, news conference with the prime minister, he turns and as expected, took no questions. He just shuffled off backstage. Mr. President, what is your red line that would prompt U.S. military involvement in this war? Mr. President, your team said you have tough questions. And there he goes. He's gone. No questions. Meanwhile, back here at home, um, it's been a bizarre thing to watch hordes of people act on utter misinformation and disinformation and go out into the streets to support... Uh, the Palestinians. And in doing so, they're basically supporting what Hamas did to Israel. And I find this just not just objectionable, but unseemly. Dearborn, Michigan, we'll show you a little of the video, as, as you can see here. Thousands of people, Dearborn, Michigan, marching in the streets, uh, pro-Palestinian. What you may not be able to hear in the background, what they're chanting is from the river to the sea. That is a big Palestinian chant. What does that mean? It means from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And it means that their goal is to wipe out Israel because Israel basically exists between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. So when they say from the river to the sea, what they're saying is we will wipe Israel off the face of the map and take all that for ourselves. That's pretty, pretty blatant. Uh, in the midst of that, there was also nothing short of an insurrection going under the Capitol. Now, you say, well, I didn't think you liked that word insurrection because on January 6th, you said it wasn't an insurrection because they really weren't trying to take over the government. They were just engaging in what some of them uh, got a little overheated with and it turned it into a riot. That's true. But if the Democrats are going to call that an insurrection, then what we saw this week could be described as nothing else other than an insurrection. You watch and tell me. As you can see, the Capitol is full of people. I wonder if they all came through metal detectors. They scream, they yell, and don't think that this was all just uh, fun and games because there was also fighting with police. Uh, there was a ripping down of signs and vandalism inside the Capitol. Uh, there were 300 arrests, but I wonder how many of them will be put in solitary confinement for eight months to a year, awaiting on a pretrial uh, hearing. I bet not many, if any. And that's where hundreds of January 6th protesters were from the time that they were arrested immediately after that. Months and months in solitary confinement in a Washington, D.C. jail. Unbelievable kind of, uh, of activities. Um, here's the big question. Could you say that what happened yesterday was an insurrection? And where is the media coverage? Where is the outrage? Where is Liz Cheney flying into Washington demanding that we hold hearings and get to the bottom of this? 
Here's just some more footage. This guy doesn't look like he's real happy. He's fighting with the police, resisting arrest. Uh, this was going on throughout the time. You know, it's just been baffling to see what has become of the media. They've, they've lost any sense of objective reporting. They're just uh, cheering for the far left all the stinking time. Let's go to some questions and see what we Absolutely, we've and this would be where you can maybe share your opinion a little bit more on this. Governor uh, Purple Hayes is asking, do you think that the free Palestine crew that got into the Capitol should be treated just like the folks, the poor folks from January 6th, those same people? Yeah, my answer is yes. Uh, the, the better answer would be, I wish the January 6th people hadn't been treated like they were. They were treated as if they uh, firebombed the place. Now, the people that rioted, I, I said from the week it happened, this was... That was criminal activity. And if, especially if they struck a police officer or refused to obey orders, there, there's some things that nobody wants to defend because it was criminal activity. They should pay for it. But there were a lot of people uh, this weekend on our show, Brandon Strzok, who's going to be one of our guests, the founder of the walkway movement, wasn't even going into the building on January 6th. He was in Washington. He was on the grounds. He never went in. He didn't hit anyone, didn't get in an argument with anyone. He got arrested put on an ankle monitor, put on the no-fly list. We'll talk about it with him this weekend. So do I think that the people who did what they did yesterday should get the same treatment as January 6th? Absolutely. Because otherwise, what Merrick Garland said recently about there's not two sets of rules, one for Democrats and one for Republicans, we're looking at this and we say, you know, yeah, there really is, Merrick, I'm sorry, but it uh, does seem to be two sets of rules. Michael Harder is asking today, Gov, what are your thoughts on the Israeli government wanting to arm all citizens now that they're being attacked while we have politicians in the U.S. trying to subvert the Second Amendment? Yeah, I think a lot of Israelis saw that um, the lack of ability for many just private citizens to have firearms at their home, unless they were reservists or some other uh, mitigating circumstance, left them absolutely vulnerable. Had they been armed, they might could have at least fought off some of the terrorists who uh, broke out of Gaza and broke into the communities and started just killing people. Um, you know, these were defenseless people. They had no weapons. They had no arms. They had no forewarning. It was just awful. So uh, might be a reminder why we have a Second Amendment. And by the way, for those who say nobody needs an AR-15, well, when you've got terrorists coming over there with uh, fully automatic weapons, uh, you know, a single shot 22 ain't going to be enough. Mm. The AR-15 with a 30-round uh, magazine might be exactly what you need. Mm. I'm going to combine a couple of these because they're al along the same subject. Uh, Judy Dean is asking why is the House having so much trouble uh, finding the right person to be Speaker? And then Debbie Blevins is saying, uh, could Jeffries be elected as Speaker of the House? I don't quite understand the process, so could you address that a little? Okay, let me take Debbie's question first. Could Jeffries be elected Speaker? Technically, yeah, he could. If uh, enough Republicans set out the vote, creating a lower threshold for the election, um, the disaster of that, the Democrats would all vote for Jeffries and he could end up being elected. It's, it's why this whole piddling around that the Republicans are doing and all beating their chest and wanting it their way is absurd. Look, I get it. Some of them are very angry about what Matt Gates and his seven uh, henchmen did. I was upset with it because I thought it was ridiculous for the eight of them to partner with the Democrats who were more than willing to join eight Republicans to get Kevin McCarthy out. Why would you let the Democrats do your dirty work for you, which is what happened? And I know there are a lot of people that think that Matt was a hero and a patriot. I'm sorry, I didn't see it that way, but I'm speaking from someone who had to govern, not from somebody who just liked to cheer on, you know, the fight. Because um, you always have to ask yourself, to what end is this? Where does this go? What does it lead us to? And what this has led us to is a paralysis in Washington. It may be that you think, well, good, we need paralysis. We need stalemate. Well, we got it. But we also need a responsible Congress that will get things done, including that we will stand with our ally Israel, that we will continue the investigations into the corrupt Biden family, all of which is on ice right now because Republicans are fighting each other. I admire Democrats for going out and sticking together, taking their fights, within the family, 
putting on a united front. And here's the point. If you're a Republican and you only have five, six, seven, eight, even 20 people who are with you, and all of your colleagues, 200 others, are not, one of two things. Either maybe your idea is not the best idea, or you're a lousy salesman and you can't sell it but to five or 10% of your whole organization. And if you can't, then maybe you ought to work on your sales skills and live with what you can. And not to say, I demand perfection or I will have nothing. Because now you get nothing. And that's what we've got out of this Congress. Did I answer Judy's question? I think I got to Debbie's. Yes. Uh, let's see her. Yes, you did. You did, absolutely. Okay. Um, right. um, I want to uh, add this one to uh, Sidney Powell. Uh, Anthony's asking, does it make it worse for Trump that Sidney Powell pled guilty in Atlanta? Yeah, I think it does uh, because she apparently cut a deal. She's essentially getting charged with six misdemeanors, chump change, no big deal. Uh, if she completes her, I think, community service, and it's mm -hmm. pretty minimal, pays a couple of fines, $2,700, $1,800. I mean, it's literally just nothing. If she does all that, she, and her record gets expunged, she keeps her law license, she doesn't have any real consequences, and it'll be far less than even an attorney fee for a week of legal representation. So on one hand, you can say, well, I don't blame her. She's trying to cut the best deal she can. Now she's mm -hmm. probably going to have to testify against everybody else. I'm sure that was the whole idea of the scholarship that she got. Um, but who knows what she's going to say? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I was kind of, I say I was surprised. Look, when it gets down to it and people potentially face jail time, the loss of their livelihood, their reputation, and, and could lose their entire life savings paying legal fees, Sometimes people just say, you know, I, I'd love to fight this, but I can't. And if you get me a deal that gets me out of it all, yeah, I'll plead guilty to some nothing. And I'll walk away from this and let other people worry about it. Okay. Uh, Patty Lang is kind of referring to what you did. You were kind of giving Democrats kudos, I suppose, for sticking together. She wants to know why in the world Republicans can't stick together. Pride, ego, um, unwillingness to accept the realities of I think sometimes um, how government has to work. It's not, you know, sometimes if I say what I just said, people say, yep, that's the problem. That's how government works, compromise. Well, yeah, it, it is compromise, and that's what you do. You get all you can, and you live to fight another day to get more of what you cannot get today. If it's an all or nothing, now or never proposition for you, I can tell you how this works. You get nothing, and you get it forever. And Republicans pretty much are getting nothing and they're getting it forever because they, they want everything right now and they don't understand the long game. It's always the short game. It's what can I get today for myself rather than how does this affect the long-term consequences in the country? I think they're, the Democrats are a little nervous about Pelosi's ability to keep them all in line. She's a master at it. You know, say what you will about Nancy Pelosi, but nobody can question her leadership skills. Uh, she would crack the whip on the Democrat caucus, and they stuck with her. Even members of the squad were afraid of her because, right. number one, she raised money for them, which is sad because Kevin McCarthy raised a boatload of money for the Republicans, and many of them uh, for whom he raised money ended up turning on him. Yeah. And, you know, you just want to say, okay, look, you don't have to like Kevin McCarthy. You don't have to agree with him. But if you take his money and you, you let him come in and campaign for you and he helps you get your seat and then you turn around and stab him in the back, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just not understanding how that's honorable. I mm -hmm. don't think it is. Don't take his money or at least give it back to him. Um, Jay Luther is asking, are they, the pro-Palestine uh, protesters, breaking stuff and assaulting people? If so, show me the video. Yeah, it's a great, great perspective and one that we don't, there is no video for that. None at all. Um, my daughter, governor of Arkansas, making a little news this week when she uh, issued a executive order saying that the state of Arkansas will no longer allow the Chinese government to uh, own land in the state of Arkansas. Here's a little bit of the press conference. Or do we have, yeah. I'm announcing that Syngenta, a Chinese state-owned agrochemical company, must give up its land holdings in Arkansas. Syngenta owns 160 acres in northeast Arkansas, 
which it uses primarily for seed research. The company that owns Syngenta, Kim China, is also on the Department of Defense's list of Chinese military companies posing a clear threat to our state. Seeds are technology. Chinese state-owned corporations filter that technology back to their homeland, stealing American research and telling our enemies how to target American farms. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably would be shocked to hear that that's a form of espionage, but it is. You know, people say, well, who cares about what seeds are? Well, I'll tell you who cares, the Chinese, because number one, if they can learn how to produce food as well as we do, um, you know, that's billions of dollars worth of research that we have done that they would steal from us. Also, if they learn some of the secrets of the seed production, what if they manipulate seed production? What if COVID was just another precursor to teach them more how to mess up the technology that can have real serious consequences to people in America and their health. So uh, good for her. Uh, pretty big article in Newsweek this week regarding this whole situation. It dates back to a case where there was a uh, Chinese individual who was actually arrested by the FBI for stealing U.S. agricultural trade secrets. This is a real thing. It's not just uh, something made up or something that might happen. And so what the Arkansas law is doing it uh, forbids Communist Chinese Party run China to be able to buy up land. And in some states, the Chinese are buying not just any farmland, but particularly farmland that is as close to and surrounding military installations. And I wonder why they would, might be doing that. Hmm. I think we know. Uh, I want to go to a couple of things. Janet Yellen this week, talking about the economy. I want you to listen and see, do you share her view of the economy under Bidenomics? The American economy is doing extremely well. Um, inflation has been high and it's been a concern to households. It's come down considerably. At the same time, we have about the strongest labor market we've seen in 50 years with 3.8% unemployment. And at the same time, um, America, the Biden administration, has passed legislation that is strengthening our economy um, in the years to come for the medium term. I think she's been eating some gummy bears laced with something because how does she say the economy is doing so well? Prices are up 17 and a half percent. Wages are down by almost three and a half percent. That's a pretty big gap, and that means that people have less expendable income in their hands right now than they did. And where it's really hitting people hard is if you try to buy a house, interest rates sky high, highest home mortgage rates in since 2008. Watch this. Yeah, I thought you were going to say it. I'll say it eight percent. The 30 year fix has jumped 20 basis points just this week as investors digest stronger than expected economic news. So now we have an eight handle. Compare that to just 3% two years ago. What that means for a person buying a $400,000 home with 20% down is they are now paying about $1,000 more a month today than they would have just two years ago. $1,000 a month more buy a $400,000 house, pay 20% down, and you're going to pay $1,000, not a year, $1,000 a month more than you did two years ago. Bidenomics, it's working all right. It's working to destroy the American dream. Mm. Well, we are going to be uh, trying to champion the American dream, and we'll be doing that on our show this weekend. But in the meantime, we want to get your questions. You can leave them in the comments section. Be sure to subscribe, hit the like button, click the notification bell so we can let you know that we're going to be uh, coming back next week.